Next up, our next speaker uh, is Elizabeth Cullivan Thomas. She's the founder and president of Launch, a product marketing firm specializing in product identity, go-to-market strategy, and all this other good stuff related to product and messaging. So uh, Elizabeth, uh, please join me in the stage here. And she's going to be talking about product messaging. So product messaging, or sometimes referred to just messaging, you know, is, is, is the description, meaning, relevance, or, you know, like value of a product. And, and Elizabeth is going to tell us what are the five essential pieces of product messaging. So Elizabeth, thank you for joining us here and take it away. Thanks for having me. Um, and do you have my slides that I sent? Share your own spot. Oh, perfect. Thank you. No. Oops. Uh, sorry, I messed it up uh, once again. All right, perfect. I see them now. Thanks, and thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Thomas, and I've been working in product marketing and product management for about 15 years, probably a little longer. Um, I work on everything from content creation to messaging, uh, product launch planning and management, um, ongoing marketing support, such as analyst relations and so on. I started launch product marketing about probably about 2014. And my primary clients are um, technology solution vendors. So I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about the process of developing fact-based product messaging or, or messaging, as you mentioned. <laughs> First off, um, the process of developing product messaging is quite complex. Uh, I've worked with several companies and can often see the surprise at the time and effort it takes to come up with with the messaging. Um, sometimes there's even frustration with the length of time that goes into it, but also the happiness that comes with the results that are based on facts is always great to see. There's lots of inputs that go into the messaging pro project, including uh, market research, understanding target audience, competitive intelligence, um, understanding your differentiators from your competition, uh, input from customers. And we'll talk about a lot of these. And pulling all of this information together in workshops or roundtables with a, a very a broad team um, can be very time consuming. So that adds to the complexity. But then you typically come to that aha moment when you see it all come together. Um, and that's the beauty of messaging, uh, building something that resonates with your target audience. Um, and that will eventually drive all downstream marketing activities. So you go from this this uh, complexity and chaos to a very clear outcome. So what I've done for today is I've put together uh, what I believe to be the five foundational elements of that messaging development process. Uh, the first one is to identify your target audience. Uh, the second is to get to know that target audience well enough that you understand what their pain points and problems are. The third is determining how your solution solves these problems um, and then what the benefits your solution uh, brings to them and then how your product is different from the rest of, of those in the market. So let's start with identifying the target audience. So the first thing you wanna do is identify who you're targeting. Um, who is it that needs your product? The target market might be B2B or B2C or B2B to C. Um, it might be a specific geography, a specific company size or demographic. Uh, for example, uh, males over 50 is a target market, as is financial institutions with 500 or more employees. And as you work on this, something you'll be able to develop is your ideal customer profile. Um, the ICP is the ideal company that's the perfect fit for your products. Um, and knowing your, your ICP helps you drill down into what their problems are and how your solution aligns and solves those problems. So this is one of those fundamental elements of the building out your product messaging. Also, what's great about building out your, your ideal customer profile is uh, eventually you can provide it to your sales team and they'll be able to, to target and appropriately talk to those um, ideal customers. 
Another thing um, that you can build out at this stage is a buyer persona. And this is a representation of your customers, their demographics, their buying decisions, um, how they find products, what motivates them, what their goals are. And this will help your um, marketing team uh, connect with, with your ideal customer, help them create engaging content in the proper tone, uh, find them where they're at, and so on and so forth. But the question is, where do you find all of this information to build out your um, ICP and your personas? You can look at data, you can dig into sales data, you can, um, and that, that data, depending on how much you have, can help you identify those companies that are, are contributing most to your, uh, your profit. Now, this is not something that is kind of one, a one-time deal and you're done after you do it the first time. You always want to constantly refine and improve your, um, your, target, uh, your target audience and your target customer. Um, for example, if your efforts aren't resonating, um, if your sales team isn't closing deals, um, perhaps you're targeting too broad or too narrow of an audience. So that's the first um, element. <clears throat> the next is understanding pain points. So your product must solve a um, customer or business problem of some sort. And this problem may be real. It might be a perceived problem. Um, in fact, the, the, the ideal customer may not even know that they have the problem until you tell them. So when defining the problem, you want to filter out all of the noise and get to the root of what their pain or their problem is. Um, and this can come as part of your audience research that we talked about in the, in the initial step. You want to learn about your customer's lifestyle. You want to learn about their work environment, what their motivations are. Uh, you want to find out why they're better off with your product. What's, gonna, what's going to improve? How, how are you going to improve their life with your product? Um, you can find this out by asking existing customers why they chose your product. You can ask the sales team what pain points um, prospects have shared with them. So there's lots of great places to get this information. Um, and again, keep in mind that you wanna dig down deep. You wanna dig into the root of the problem. So if a customer says, um, for example, that they're having a slow quarter, the sales team is having a slow sales uh, quarter, that's not the root problem. Often the next question is, well, why are they having a slow quarter? And they might blame marketing's leads. Um, those leads are non-existent or they're poor quality leads. Still, this probably isn't the root problem. You want to keep digging. Um, and it might come down to confusing processes or the market that's being targeted. For example, they're, uh, they're targeting too broad of a market or too narrow of a market. So I've included some samples of um, problems that may uh, those root problems that may exist. So small business owners, a problem that they might have is the ability to afford um, automation to tools or find tools that are affordable and within their budget. Um, a sales team's root problem um, when they're not closing deals may be because of confusing processes. Uh, an agency that's always running behind in their schedules um, may be because they're waiting on clients to respond. And a marketing team um, might be targeting too broad of an audience or too narrow of an audience, as I said a little bit earlier. So those are uh, that's the second element. The third is you want to determine how your product or service solves the customer problem that you've previously identified. Um, and the ability to solve the problem is what makes your product relevant um, and necessary in the market. Something that's worthwhile to look at further, um, if you haven't heard of it before, is the jobs to be done uh, methodology. Um, the point of it is that customers want a product that is going to do a job for them. For example, the need to find uh, files and images quickly, the ability to prevent a burglary in my home or the ability to file my taxes confidently are all jobs that a product can do for customers. There's a quote, once you start, if you do any research on the jobs to be done, you'll find a quote. Uh, I see it a lot. Uh, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. This makes uh, the, the definition of jobs to be done very clear. You want to leave out the, the vague features and function lists and talk about the job the product will do 
for your customer when you're when you're talking about that that problem that you're solving. And then the next element is what benefits do you offer to your customers? Um, I'm going to go back to that features statement that I made before. Um, Keep in mind that features are not benefits. I constantly see this in marketing material and it drives me a little bit crazy um, where companies are talking about benefits, but they essentially just list uh, a bunch of product features. Um, and those aren't, aren't the, the benefits that are being brought to your customers. Uh, you wanna ask yourself, how does the solution you're providing um, getting the job done, how does getting the job done for your customer actually benefit them? So again, back to that uh, jobs to be done. If you're getting that job done for your customer, how is it providing benefit to their life? And this is another area when it, where you wanna dig down and look at the problem you've identified, that root problem um, and how you solve the problem and then what the ultimate benefit is. And you'll often see benefits associated with productivity gains, customer success, uh, uh, financial gains, and uh, security risk reduction. And then let's talk about uh, differentiation. You'll also have to figure out how your product is different and better than the competitors out there. Um, and this is going to require competitive intelligence to understand what your competitors offer um, and how they're different from you. Um, and this, this competitive intelligence can be gathered by talking to customers, um, existing customers, uh, if they're willing to talk to you about the products that they evaluated up front or the services they evaluated and why they chose you. Another group of people that you can talk to are lost deals. Some of the uh, best information when doing uh, research for messaging and, and identifying differentiators and points and shopping habits and all of that stuff um, can come from from lost deals it's really really useful information again if they're willing to talk to you um, and here's a test that you can use for your messaging to determine if it's differentiated enough if you if you write out your message and then you take the names off of of that message and replace it with your your competitors names is the message true for the competitors if it is um, the customers will probably purchase a less expensive option. So you want to make sure that your messaging is differentiated enough and it can't be, um, you know, it's not the same or equivalent to your competitors. And then finally, um, one thing that, that I appreciate uh, that, I've, that I've, I've read quite a bit about um, is this, uh, the Toyota way, Genshi Jambutsu. Um, if you haven't read about it, it's, it's pretty interesting what, what Toyota does, but this translates into real location, real thing. And Toyota believes that if you go um, and see what's going on on the factory floor uh, in person, that's the only way you'll truly understand the situation uh, and the only way you'll be able to collect actual facts. So I find this, this true for building out messaging as well. Um, I think it's a great habit to adopt um, visiting customers. I know it's difficult these days to visit in person, but eventually we'll get back to it. Um, visiting customers, maybe doing virtual uh, Zoom sessions, calls with them, sit on sales calls, um, call those lost customers, understand why they moved away from your product and ask them all these questions. Um, and you can turn this into a great exercise that'll help you build out uh, customer personas. Um, and I, I, I believe that this is one of the best ways to build your messaging based on facts. Um, and then that messaging, uh, once you have it, of course, you're going to refine it and improve it uh, over time. You want to revisit it on a regular basis. Um, but the, the great part of it is that it'll help drive those um, downstream marketing activities. You'll know who, who your ideal customers are. Um, you'll know what problems they have, you'll know how they you solve them, you'll know what benefits you bring to them, um, and you know why you're different from the competition. So you'll really be able to, to um, build out those personas and, and, and uh, talk with them in a way that resonates. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate the invite. I hope that this was helpful. Um, there's my website on the screen. Feel free to contact me with any questions.
Thank you so much, Elizabeth. So of let's uh, let's uh, answer some of the questions that uh, that I have, and then people might have. So people type in your questions. I'll I'll get to them in a in a second. So first question I have is like by the way I loved your the method that uh, your recommendation that if you change out uh, the competitors or your brand name can you know can they understand who's saying it uh, before Drift relaunched as their um, revenue acceleration platform I did this very thing with Aircom and Drift where I uh, changed out the names and, and I showed the copy to people and people could not tell the difference between Aircom and Drift. Now both of them are leading. This is Aircom. This is Drift acceleration platform. So, interesting to see. so what about a tool like MailChimp? So since MailChimp stopped being an email marketing tool and they now do everything, if you go to their website, I don't know if you've been recently, but they say very generic, vanilla, boring things. So what's your take there? Well, uh, I haven't been to their website recently, I confess. Um, but I think some, so the generic messaging, that's, that's um, troublesome, but it's a very crowded space. Um, but I think some some companies like a Mailchimp can go on brand reputation too. Um, you know, it's it's a well known brand. Um, you know, it might be top of mind, uh, a big customer base, so people come to them through referrals or recommendations. Um, so so there's there's something to be said for that, um, and and maybe they they get most of their customers that way, and they're not as concerned about differentiating through messaging. I, I I agree 100. percent It's like like Byron Sharp's work is showing that market penetration and awareness is so much more important than um, differentiation. And so the mental availability once I have the trigger that oh I need email marketing, I think Mail Mailchimp in our mind is readily available. Yeah. Who would you know. say? Who would you say uh, is an example of a company, maybe a SaaS company that is? Is doing a really good job with messaging. Somebody we should, uh, you know, look up to. Well, I'm going to use a really weird example. It's not going to be a SaaS company, but it's somebody that I I really appreciate. And um, it's Trader Joe's. I don't know if anyone on here gets their um, their monthly newsletter, um, but they send out a paper version. Plus, they have it online. But their descriptions of each and every one of their products is just amazing. It's clear. It's perfectly messaged to their target audience, the way they speak. Um, I just have always loved their, when I first got their newsletter, I got, I get a paper copy in the mail and I was just, oh my gosh, this is really written well, written toward their audience. Um, perfect, clear descriptors makes you want to go there and shop. Yeah, cool. Um, there's a there's a question by Samir here. So what do you do if you have a product that is not better than the competition and and might be even work in progress? So let's say it's it's a new startup, you know, and then if it's email marketing, you don't have all the features that Mailchimp and other market leaders have. What do you do? I think you want to build out your roadmap. Um, you know, have plans for the future on how you're going to be better. Um, and as far as messaging goes, I mean, as you as you talk with your prospects, um, if, you, if you don't have customers yet, but who are your ideal prospects? Who do you think are your ideal prospects? Narrow that down and really get in their brains, figure out what their problems are, how you're going to solve them. You're going to look at the, 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 the different companies that you are going to compete with in the future. You're going to see what they're saying. Um, and I think you'll discover a lot and you'll be able to build out your roadmap um, to eventually solve the customer's real problems, even beyond what the competitors are doing based on what you're discovering when you're talking to um, uh, your ideal customer. Uh, another question here in, in the chat. Um, is the importance of messaging um, over time. So I guess the question is, how important is messaging when you're just start starting out, you're you know, a new entry to a category versus you're an old established player in a mature category like MailChimp? So how does the, um, 
importance of messaging evolve or change over time? Sure, sure. Um, I have worked on messaging for, for companies that are a variety of sizes, brand new companies up through very established brands. Um, and I, I'm going to say that it's important all the time. Um, initially, just going through the messaging process is going to provide so much more than just a messaging statement. It's going to provide so much information about um, who you're targeting and, and what you can do better. And then as you grow and revisit that messaging, it's going to evolve. Um, so, so like I said, I think it's just as important for a small non-established brand to a very established brand. And for a small one that's just getting started, it's going to probably change pretty quickly. Yeah. As yeah, you I learn. Positioning is one of those things that shouldn't change too often, provided that you nail it. But like messaging is something that evolves all the yeah. time and you should be checking your messaging because, you know, the competition is not sleeping, uh, market is evolving, you know, times are different and, and all that stuff. Yeah. All right, Elizabeth, thank you so much. It was great to learn from you and we'll see you next time on the internet somewhere. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Have a great day.